Hi everyone, you're welcome again to my YouTube channel. My name is Cher Benjamin Agbo and today I'll be teaching on the prayer of Thanksgiving. If today is your very first time of watching my video, I want to encourage you to like, to subscribe and to leave a comment in the chat room. I would see it and um, it's a great feedback and it also increases the algorithm of the video. So I want to encourage you to subscribe, put on the not your notification bell so that when next I post a video, you will be the first to, um, to get it. So today I'll be teaching on the subject of prayer of thanksgiving. Before I go into that, I want you to know that there are different kinds of prayer. I'm currently doing a series on my channel where I'm talking about the different kinds, the different kinds of prayer, and the different qualities of prayer. Uh, I've taught on um, the prayer of petition, where I taught on how you can have your prayers answered. Um, I've taught on perseverance in prayers. You can get all these videos in my on my YouTube channel. Just um, and you can also click on the playlist. I also have more that are coming on the subject of prayer so do all to like to subscribe and to leave a comment so that I know that you watch this video all right today I'll be teaching on the subject of Thanksgiving but first and foremost I want to start from the book of Ephesians 6 verse 18 Ephesians 6 verse 18 says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints praying always in my previous videos i shared why i shared how in most places that prayer was mentioned in the scripture emphasis was on always consistency the frequency the continuity it's very important when in, in, in this on, on the subject of prayer god expects us to pray at every opportunity that we get so, but this scripture says praying always with all prayer actually the original rendition is praying always with all kinds of prayer and supplication there are different kinds of, of, of prayers and there are different principles guarding each of those prayers for example in my kitchen I have different kinds of um, equipment there is the blender the fridge the microwave uh, the microwave um, the gas uh, the, the stove I mean there are different tools in the kitchen I can't use the blender to um, make rice neither can I use my fridge to uh, to 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 microwave bread they all serve different functions so also there are different kinds of prayer and if you don't understand the rules the principle on the guarding each of this of each of these types of prayer you will not be able to uh, maximize each of each of them so i want to teach today on the subject of prayer of thanksgiving prayer of thanksgiving there's the prayer of intercession there's the prayer of authority there's the prayer of agreement there is the prayer of supplication there is prayer of consecration and there is prayer of thanksgiving each of these prayers are used differently in the scriptures there are different approach to these prayers there are different rules and principle on the guarding them but today i want to focus on the subject of prayer of thanksgiving in the book of luke 11 verse 1 luke 11 verse 1 bible says now it came to pass as he was praying that was jesus as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him lord teach us to pray as john also taught his disciples to pray bible says jesus was praying in a place his disciples were there and they waited for him to finish and one of them asked lord teach us to pray there are three things i want you to get from this place number one prayer must be taught Prayer must be said, teach us to pray. They had observed that all the miracles in the life of Jesus, all the signs and the wonders, all the things people saw about him was, you know, it, was, it got them from the place of prayer, even how effective his message was. You know, he said in the book of John, he says, I don't do anything of my own accord. I don't do anything on my own authority. Whatsoever the Father tells me, that is what I say. I, I receive orders from him, what to say and how to say it. So the disciples knew, they understood that the, 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 the reason or the effectiveness of Jesus' ministry was because of his prayer life. So one of them just that Jesus teach us to pray. That means prayer can be taught. Prayer must be taught. And they said, as John taught his disciples to pray, that means for you to be an effective um, praying Christian, you must be taught how to pray, the principles of prayer, the different kinds of prayer, the 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 
the way to apply them the situation and the circumstances you need to apply all these kinds of prayer so prayer can be taught and the best way to teach prayer is actually by praying prayer and you know another thing i want you to um learn from this place was that they saw jesus praying the followers of Jesus, his disciples saw him praying. There are a lot of leaders today that are not able to communicate their lifestyle to people. They tell people to do what they are saying, not what they do. We say one thing, but we we'll teach another. But I want you to know that a prayerless pulpit, we begat a prayerless pew. If you are a leader that is not giving to prayer, the people following you will not automatically become a people of prayer. So if you lead a congregation, if you're in charge of a spiritual community, you lead a group or a team of, of four or five whatever the the people following you see in you that is what they will do the most people tend to do what we do more than um what we tell them to do the people tend to do what they see us do than what we say what we tell them to do people focus more on our actions than our words and that's how life is you have to live by your lifestyle and this was the leadership that jesus had this was the kind of leadership jesus demonstrated it was an exemplary leadership he first had a lifestyle of prayer i mean he was the man that took his disciples to the mountains he took them when he was getting ready to die he took them to guest man he did not do ministry alone he did not intercede alone he had this team of people around him and then he show them this is how to do ministry eventually when he left he told them tarry in jerusalem and for about 40 days they were there bible says they were there in one accord they prayed they chose new a new disciple they did things together in one accord because that was how jesus did ministry while he was on earth so prayer must be taught and a leader must exempl exemplify a lifestyle of prayer to the people that he leads don't just pray when you get to the pulpit don't just pray when you get you're giving the platform to lead the people of god make sure in your secret in your secret place in your closet you have a lifestyle of prayer you have a life because you can teach what you know but you can only impact who you are if you are not a person of prayer you're not going to impact to the pe impact the people you lead a lifestyle of prayer so jesus had a lifestyle of prayer his disciples observed they saw it and they asked him to teach them how to pray and by the time Jesus was going to teach them, verse 2 says, So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven. This is not a static prayer that every time you want to pray, this is what you pray. Because there are people today, they don't know any other kind of prayer than the Lord's Prayer. This is what we call the Lord's Prayer. It was a, an a highlighted principle. He's not saying every time you want to pray, these are the only things you say. But in the process of praying, these are the proper protocol of prayer. These are the proper protocols of prayer. These are the principles under guarding prayer. When you go into the place of prayer, these are the way, as in, this is the way your prayer life should be. So the first thing he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Why this is not a static or a statutory prayer or a stereotypic prayer is that after this place, there was no other place in the Bible where they said that they needed to pray and this was, it was the Lord's prayer they recited. When the disciples were arrested in the book of Acts chapter 4, they were threatened to no longer speak in the name of Jesus. Bible says they went to their own company and they reported all the chief priests and their elders had done to them. And Bible says they prayed together and they prayed a scripture from the book of Psalms. They did not recite the Lord's Prayer, showing you that this is a principle. This is um, this is a, 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 a highlighted principle, and highlighted protocol to understand prayer, to understand how prayer must be made. So the first thing he said was, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. See, the first protocol of prayer is thanksgiving, praise, worship. Thanksgiving is the first protocol of prayer. A lot of people barging on God with their tongues. They barging on God with their petitions. They have a lot of things bothering their minds. They know God is a prayer answering God. So they just enter the place of prayer. They wake up in the morning. Mara, take a call, Lord, do it. You know, they are so pressed for something. The first thing they, they wake up with, the first thing they do in the place of prayer is to begin to make petitions, to make requests. No, that is not the proper protocol of prayer. In the realm of the 
the spirit protocols are important there is a proper order that things must be done in the in the realm of the spirit bible says when you want to pray jesus said our father in heaven and we are make we are making prayers to god god we are acknowledging the fatherhood of god see when you come to the place of prayer the first thing you must understand is the nature of the person you are praying to a lot of people miss out on the request they miss out on answers because they don't understand the nature of the god they are praying to so they misjudge his ability to perform you must first understand that your prayer is to the father you must take time to hallow his name hallow his name in worship in praise and in thanksgiving hallelujah in the book of psalm 100 verse 4 psalm 100 verse 4 says enter into his gates with thanksgiving enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise be thankful to him and bless his name he says enter his gate that gate signifies an entrance it's like you come into my house now you can't come in through the window you can't come in through the back door you have to come in through the front door which is like the entrance it says what one way to present yourself at the entrance of god's house the entrance of god's presence is to come with thanksgiving that word gate in the in the in in hebrew means sha it's like an entrance why is caught is it's, it's called chadza it's like an inner chamber it's like you come into my house and then you you knock on the door by the time you are knocking you are knocking with your thanksgiving you are knocking with your praise you are knocking with your worship if i allow you if i usher you in and then i give you access into my bedroom you begin to see things that are not on the outside that outsiders cannot see an outsider can, does, does not know what is in my living room an outsider does not know what is in my bedroom an outsider does not know what is in my in my kitchen but the moment i grant you entrance into my house i'm giving you access into all of me so he says enter his gate with thanksgiving but when you go to his you for you to enter his court it is with praise we thank god for what he has done we praise him for who he is but we worship him because of his holiness because the more you have a revelation of god the more praise will be birthed on your inside the moment you enter let's assume you've never been to my house before and you probably thought maybe i was a poor person or um i mean a, a wannabe kind of girl and then you get to my house and suddenly you are you are marveled by all the things you see i didn't know that your house is this beautiful i did not know that your living room is this amazing i didn't know you have have all this decor i did not know see that alone creates an unusual excitement and awe a holy hole in your heart when god gives you a revelation of who he is he births something on your inside the revelation of who god is should birth praise on your inside i'm still going to do a teaching on praise but in this teaching i want to focus on thanksgiving thanksgiving enter his gate with thanksgiving that's the first protocol prayer our father who art in heaven hallowed be your name it is proximity that brings you into deeper revelation of god and it makes you respond in praise it says enter is caught with praise enter is caught with praise proximity brings you into a deeper revelation of god and then it births an unusual dimension of praise inside of you hallelujah psalm 116 verse 17 psalm 116 verse 17 says i will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving notice the progression in the scripture i will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the lord so the psalmist said i have many things on my heart i have many petitions i have many requests that i want to make from god but before i make those requests i will first offer to him the sacrifice of thanksgiving it is called sacrifice for a reason it must be sacrificial not something you do just to palliate your conscience for some of us we you know we go to the place of prayer you praise over there and you worship god you thank god but it's you are just doing it as a routine as a religious duty you don't understand that you are hallowing god you ought to hallow him and have a consciousness of his presence a consciousness of his nature a consciousness of his power you should remember what the lord has done see thanksgiving is not what we do as a routine it's not a religious duty a lot of people use it to start prayer and to close prayer thanksgiving is prayer in itself it's not just a way to start or end prayer it is prayer in itself god acknowledges your thanksgiving the moment you say our father hallowed be your name you are attracting the presence of god in your direction but if you do it religiously you do it with um 
you know, there, there's a place in the scripture that says, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. There are people who start prayer. They sing. They dance, they shout, but their heart is not connected with their praise. They are praising an abstract God or they are just ticking a box on their prayer list. That yes, we have to sing. That's how we start prayer in this house. Thanksgiving is more than a routine. It's not a religious duty. It's not a routine. It's a protocol of the spirit in approaching the presence of God. It's a protocol of the spirit in approaching the presence of God. Thanksgiving must precede your, your petitions or your request. The psalmist said, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and I will call upon your name. Before I present my petition, I will first offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Before I ask God for the things that I need for the day, I will first present my thanksgiving. And the way to wrap up prayer, not just to wrap up prayer, but the appropriate way when you are done, you know, Thanksgiving, you've made your inter intercession, petition, you bind the devil, you've done all the, you bound the devil, all those things. The next thing that must end your prayer is also the prayer of Thanksgiving. Some of us do it quickly. As soon as you're running no prayer, you're already taking your phone, you're checking your notification. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for answered prayers. Blah, blah, blah. See, that one you do at the end of prayer is a reflection of your faith in the ability of God to perform. It is not another thing you do religiously to end prayer. Thanksgiving, a lot of people have been conditioned to see it as a way to start and end prayer. It is prayer in itself. The same way you, you made your petition with intensity, with fervency of earth, of heart, you must also thank God at the end of your request, knowing that yes, truly you, you've answered everything I've requested and I will see the manifestation of the things I've prayed for. It's a reflection of your faith in the ability of God to perform. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 it says be anxious for nothing be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving with thanksgiving that means prayer is incomplete your, your prayer is not complete without thanksgiving it says let your request be made known to God it says be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving so until you thank god your prayer is not yet complete no matter the number of petitions and the request and number of hours you have spent interceding supplicating you know until you thank god your prayer is incomplete you know lack of gratitude is a sign of the end time Lack of gratitude is a sign of the end time. Thanksgiving requ requires a lot of reflection, humility, and memory. Let me, let me show you a scripture. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 2. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 2. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 2. It says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come perilous times, difficult times, hard times, in the last days. He says, for men will be lovers of themselves, self-love, lovers of money, boasters. I know some of you are saying, at least I'm not selfish. Yes, I love myself because God says I should love others. I should love my neighbor just the way I love myself. So if I don't love myself, there's no way I can love my neighbor. Yes, that's true. But if it is born out of a selfish motivation where your life is just centered about me, myself, and I, maybe you are not selfish when it comes to love. You are not a lover of money. You are not a bo you don't boast. You are not proud. You are not a blasphemer. He said some will be lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents. Do you see that? Disobedient to parents is another sign of the end time. And then he made mention of something that blew my mind. He says, unthankful. Unthankful. See, if you are the type that, that lacks um, the understanding of gratitude, you don't know how to thank God for every little thing. The signs of the end time, they are catching up with you already. He says, unthankful. 
People that are not humble enough to thank God for all his workings in their lives. People that are always in a haste to ask God for this, ask God for that, but they never take time to settle and thank him for all those little things. Lack of gratitude is a sign of the end time. It is a reflection of pride. When people are not thankful, when people don't take time to remember what God has done, it is a reflection of pride. You are indirectly telling God, yes, you did something, but I mean, anybody could have done that. No, you could not have done it for yourself. Bible says there is nothing any man has received. There is nothing, nothing any man has received that he has not been given from above. There is nothing in your life that you have, the breath in your lungs, the job that you have. I know you boast about how you work nine to five every day of the week. That that's it is because of how hard you work that makes you earn the um the kind of money you have so you boast in your ability to work see god gave you that job i know you passed you passed college with it in i mean you passed out of college with flying colors you were so brilliant so intelligent that companies you applied to several companies and you did not know the one to choose because you thought it was the prowess of your of your of your of your um of your brain or the the prowess of your skills that has afforded you the job that you have today i want you to know that there is nothing bible says there is nothing any man has received that he has not been given from above every good and perfect gift comes from God is it a good gift it is from God is it perfect it is from God is it something that is so insignificant that you don't even remember to thank God for it is still from God every good and perfect gift comes from God so this is why you must thank God thanksgiving Lack of gratitude is a reflection of pride. So when you don't thank God for all the little, little things in your life, see, pride has already set in. That is another sign of the end time. Because if you are proud, you will never be thankful. Our imaginations will become vain when we don't give thanks. Your thoughts, the seat of your imagination, it will become vain when you don't give thanks. I want you to see this scripture, Romans 1.21. Romans 1 21 Romans 1 21 There are people that are atheist agnostic that they people claim that God does not exist or who know God exists but they choose not to serve him as God do you know how or why they got to that point in their life Bible says verse let me read from verse 20 it says for since the creation of the world his invincible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse verse 21 says because although they knew god they did not glorify him as god nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened they knew that see creation the the, there is proof of god in everything around us creation the firmament everything god created these things i know science has found a way to explain it away they tell you that man evolved from apes they tell you about um charles darwin's theory of they tell you about the, the evolution theory i mean science has tried to explain god away but bible says there are things in creation that makes god visible even to the atheists to the agnostic agnostic agnostics he said everything but they refuse they knew there is they know that there is a god but they refuse to acknowledge him as god and they are unthankful and because of this they have become vain in their imagination their understanding has become darkened they are futile in their thoughts when someone becomes unthankful, they will become vain in their imaginations. You just begin to, you, you will embrace philosophy over the scriptures. You will think science is greater than God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanksgiving involves memory, humility, and reflection. See, Thanksgiving requires you to sit down and think and reflect on the past busy people are never thankful because they don't have time to reflect thanksgiving requires reflection there are times in my life 
I mean, I still thank God for what happened a year ago. What happened almost five months ago. How the Lord came through for me seven months ago. I don't ever want to get over what God has done for me. Never in my life. There's a song by um, Maverick City and Elevation Worship, um, Million Little Miracles. That song is powerful. It's, it's called Million Little Miracles. Like all those little, little things I don't ever want to forget. I don't ever want to. There was a time in your life you needed something so desperately and you took it to God in the place of prayer and you answered and he answered you. Now that you have answers to your prayers, you are forgotten. Even though it was 10 years ago, some of you, you, you sought the face of God for the fruit of the womb. The Lord gave you that child. Today, you don't even remember to thank God for those, those, those seasons of your life that you were crying and beseeching God for his mercies, that he will look upon you and grant you the fruit of the womb. Today you have the child, all you do is just post pictures on social media. You don't remember to thank God for the pregnancy. You don't remember to thank God for the labor. You don't remember to thank God for the childbirth. You don't remember to thank God for how he preserves that child from every evil. Thanksgiving, it, it, it involves memory. It involves, it involves reflection. It involves humility. Thanksgiving involves humility, reflection, and memory. Busy people are not always thankful because they don't have time to reflect. You must have time to reflect on the faithfulness of God. And that's why Thanksgiving is not what you rush, to, you rush in to do and you rush out. No, you must sit down and recount the psalmist said, I will sing of the faithfulness of God in the, his loving kindness in the morning and his faithfulness at night. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. He says, with my mouth will I make known his faithfulness to all generations. With my mouth will I make known his faithfulness to all generations. I will sit down and remember the years of his miracle marvels in my life. Oh, God has done amazing things for me. I don't know about you. I know that God has done the same thing for you too. As I'm talking like this, I'm remembering a thousand and one things that God has done in my life. Oh, I can't begin to recount. See, that's between me and God. And when I get to the place of prayer, there are many wonderful things. And I'm not even able to share with you publicly that the Lord has done. It's too, it's too big for, for a natural mind to even comprehend sometimes. That God, why would you love me this way? See, see what you have done for me. See, you must get to a point in your life where God elevates you, but you, you retain your humility. There was a time, there was a time David wanted to build a house for the Lord. David wanted to build a house for the Lord. And then God sent, let us read it. Second Samuel 7. Second Samuel, let us read that scripture. Second Samuel. Second Samuel verse 7. Because there is one thing that I've observed. As God elevates people in life, there's that tendency to want to abandon God. There's that tendency to not want to do life on your own. Second Samuel from the ch chapter 7 from verse 1 says, And it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house that the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. That the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside ten curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day. But I've moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I've moved about with all the children of Israel, have I spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? God was saying, I never laid a demand on anybody. But this guy decided to build a house for me. Even though I've been dwelling in tents and, you know, in tabernacles, I did not ask, and I did not lay a demand on anybody, on any king, on any prophet to build me a house. I was content dwelling in the midst of my people in tents. Verse 9 says, uh, verse 8, Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold. 
from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel and I've been with you wherever you have gone and I've cut off all your enemies from before you and I've made you a great name like the name of the men who are on, like the name of the great men who are on the earth moreover I will appoint a place for my people Israel and we plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own God made a lot of promises now to David now see what happened verse 17 according to all these words and according to all this vision so Nathan spoke to David so God was so he was so happy he was so excited that someone would think of building him a house even though he did not make a request for such he was just happy that this guy has not forgotten where he took him from that I took him from the sheep photo because I, I, you know, there was a time I studied about the kings in Israel and in Judah. There was a pattern in all of them, from Solomon to Rehoboam to Jeroboam to Asha to Abijah. I mean, quite a number of them. I think Asha was not one of, one of them. Uzzah, all of most kings in Israel and in Judah. As soon as God elevates them, gives them victory, they always forget God. They always neglect God. It's either they go after another God or they start looking to their colleagues for help. But David was not that kind of guy. God elevated him. He, he gave him a great name. He gave him rest from all his enemies. He established him in, in, um, in Israel. And he said, you have decided to do this for me. And God made so many promises to him. And then it was that time God told him that he would like, it says, verse 14, I will be his father and he will be my son. He says his house, in verse 16, his house and his kingdom shall be established forever. God told him, see, forever there will be always be someone in your lineage on the throne. And that's why Jesus had to come through the lineage of David. He was referred to as the son of David. Jesus, the son of David. He came through the lineage of David. And see the response of David to um, the promises of God. Verse 18, Bible says, then King David, <laughs> they put the word king, not just David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, who am I, Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? <laughs> See, you should get to a point in your life where you will never be too big in the presence of God. That you will lose your childishness, but you will never lose your childlikeness in the presence of God. Bible says, King David. With all his attire, in all his splendor, in all his beauty. Bible says he went in and sat before the Lord. He sat. In, imagine someone just sitting down on the ground that God, who am I? What is my house that you have brought me this far? There should be those moments in your in your prayer time with God where you just Oh, you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and say, God, see what you have done. See how far you have brought me. I wouldn't be here if not for your grace. I mean, if I was not given that visa, I couldn't have been in this country. If I was not given that admission, I would still be at home. If you didn't give me this child, I would still be barren. If you did not give me this job, I would still be hungry. And then King David sat before the Lord. That is, that is the peak of humility. If you understand that kings of those days, they don't, I mean, there was a time David danced and Bible says, Micah, or what was her name, spited him. And because of that, that woman became barren. And she was the only barren woman in the Bible that never gave birth. Because there were other barren women in the Bible that God answered their prayers. But she's because she's, she spited a man that was praising his God. Thanksgiving magnifies God. It brings God, the manifest presence of God into your situation. In the book of Psalms 103 verse 2, from verse 1 to 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. It says, Forget not his benefit. It says, Psalm 103, let me read it, verse 1 to 2. Psalms 103. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefit. It says, Forget not, because we have the tendency to forget. David did not forget that God brought him out from the sheepfold, from leading sheep to come and lead his people. God gave him a great name. God established his throne in Israel. God gave him rest from all his enemies. He could have used that opportunity to, you know, to just. See, as, as me as I did now, as me as I am, I'll go just enjoy my life. People that know that joke, they know what I'm talking about. 
but he sat before the Lord. Say, God, who am I? I am what I am by your grace. I am here, I am where I am today because of your power. It says, forget not his benefit. We have the tendency to forget. We will forget if we don't make an effort to remember. Remembering God's faithfulness, it takes effort. To recount it, some of us, we hide under the cloak of tongues. We don't know how to give thanks in understanding that, Lord, I am grateful for this season of my life that I waited on you for a job and you came through for me. I am grateful for when I sat for that certification. I did not fail, even though I, I didn't feel qualified. I am grateful that I, have, I now have this job that I've desired all my life. I'm grateful that I completed my college degree with your grace. I mean, be grateful for everything. Remember but don't forget you have the tendency to forget let me tell you lastly let me share this with you God is big on memorials God is big on memorials like I said this is the prayer of thanksgiving I'm still gonna do a, a, a video on the subject of praise there's a difference between thanksgiving and praise he says enter his gate with thanksgiving but he's caught you enter his court with praise not with thanksgiving gate is different from court one is the entrance the other one is the inner chamber i will talk about how praise can be a weapon in your life god is big on memorials in the book of joshua joshua chapter 4 joshua chapter 4 verse 1 to 7 joshua chapter 4 verse 1 to 7 when the children of israel was going to cross over um river jordan God told them, gave them a specific instruction that is very profound. He says, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. He says, And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourself twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Now go to verse go to verse seven. Let us start from verse 6. So after Joshua told the people to do this, he now made a statement. He says that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Verse 7 says, then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over to the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. So God parted river Jordan for them and they, they went by foot. The priest stood in the middle of the river carrying the ark of the covenant while the children of Israel marched to the other side. But God told them, choose one man from every tribe. Let them carry a stone from where the priests are standing the priests are standing he says later when your children ask you what does this stone what do these stones mean you will tell them there was a time where we were in need of a major miracle and we were in the wilderness god had promised to take us to the to canaan land to the promised land to canaan and then in the midst of uh, that wilderness experience god parted a major river for us to cross and this stone is from that river. It says, this shall be a memorial forever to the children of Israel. God is big on memorials. Even when he takes you to the promised land, he does not want you to forget where he has brought you from. Many people get to the promised land and they forget the Lord their God. They forget the processes. They, forgo they forget the prayers, the time of fasting, the times of waiting, the times of supplication. They forget how God came through. They forget the faithfulness of God. I don't want you to forget. Wherever you are, I want you to lift your hands and begin to thank God. If you need to sit, sit. If you need to lie on your face, lie on your face. Say, God, who am I? What is my house that you have brought me this far? Begin to recount all those things. The time you led me through the wilderness, the time you parted the Red Sea, the time you parted River Jordan. Begin to recount his faithfulness. I don't ever want to forget what God has done for me. Even if it takes 10 years after, I still want to remember. They may be little miracles, but they are mighty. They are mighty. It's like a paradox. Million little miracles. It, but they are mighty miracles. Mighty miracles. 
if you if you can you can play the song maybe only to miracles by maverick city and elevation worship i'm sure it will minister to you and it will bless you just take time to thank god and never present your petition your intercession your supplication to god without entering his gate with thanksgiving now in my next video i'm going to talk on praise the subject of praise and how it can be a weapon all right thank you for watching like i said you can like you can comment leave that like a feedback for me and then subscribe to this video you can also share it with other people and put on the notification bell so that when next i upload a video i premiere a video you can be notified thank you for watching god bless you my name is Cher Benjamin Ago. i'll see you next time